All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I've been asked to speak on the tribal origins in the Cordillera. And my talk is going to be based on a study of languages. That study is called linguistics and the people that uh, engage in that science are called linguists. And the first thing I want to make clear is I am not a linguist. So what I'm going to tell you today is secondhand information told to me by people who are linguists. And the two most important of them for me are one, my grandfather, who was a linguist, a uh, professor at the University of the Philippines, and he did most of his studies on Cordillera languages. But he was also an administrator in the very early uh, American uh, takeover of uh, the Cordillera from the Spaniards. Um, and the second thing is that uh, my grandfather passed, passed away a while ago, but I've had the fortune of having extended conversations with a person who, while not a Filipino, spent many years in Bontoc and is probably the leading expert on Philippine languages. His name is Lawrence Reed, oh. and I'll show you some of his slides uh, in a while. So languages. The first thing to do, I think, is to just get a very simple, basic understanding of uh, linguistics, and it's not going to be very complicated. The first idea I'd like to present there is that languages change. They change even if you're a group of people living in an island in the middle of an ocean and uh, nobody ever meets you. Over generations and centuries, your language will change. Okay, so as you look at this, you wonder what the heck this is, what language is this? Well, this is English. It's English from a thousand years ago. It's called Old English. And it's almost unrecognizable to you now, but that's how languages change, right? Now, how do we use this idea of how languages change to look at Cordillera migration? Next slide. Okay, so if you follow from the upper left down to the lower right, we'll see that a group of people whom we'll call A, speaking a language called A, settled in a river valley called A. And they were very successful and their population grew. And at some point they realized that they couldn't all live in that one place. So a hardy group of them decided to cross over a very difficult mountain trail over to the other side of the mountain and where they found another river valley that they could sit, uh, that they could settle. So now you had two groups of people speaking language A on opposite sides of a very difficult to cross uh, mountain range. Because languages change at some point, and you go down to the lower left, the languages will vary. And you, I mark them as language A1 and language A2. And some people will call those dialects. If you got a person speaking A1 together with a person speaking A2 for one reason, they'll be able to understand each other. Although one will probably say to the other, uh, gee, you talk funny. However, as more generations and years go by, the languages diverse, diverge so much that what you get are two different languages now. You get the language A and a language B, and I put them out in green because neither of those two languages resembles the first language, uh, which I put in red of language A, which is very much like that old English that I put up in the last slide. Now, at this point, if you got a person from the A group together with a person from the B group, they would not understand each other. The very definition of languages is that the two groups will be mutually unintelligible. All right, so it's at this situation in the lower right that the linguist comes in and he'll look at those two languages and he'll say, hmm, I think these languages have some similarities. And he'll explore those similarities to try to figure out what they have in common. Now, uh, if you could go to the next slide. Okay, and here we are again. Now, this is English. And can you guess what it's saying since it's English? Well, you've all been to church. This is the Our Father. And you'll notice that it starts with father and then goes to our. So instead of our father, it's father our. And then on that first line, you could probably figure out earth and heaven. 
the words earth and heaven. Second line, you could probably figure out the word name and so forth and so on. So the linguists can look at this and look not just at the words, but the grammar, how those words are put together and also how they're pronounced, what they call phonology. Okay, and they can take the green A and green B, figure out that they are similar and also figure out that the, the common language that gave rise to both of them, what was the red A? That process is called reconstruction. And from reconstruction, they can figure out that not only are A and B both derived from language A, but they can figure out that uh, language A was the origin. So you can then say that group B speaking language B, that group of people originated in area A. And that's how you can figure out how people move uh, around, around the area using language. Okay, uh, so let's, uh, so now, if these language A and B are actually related, they will have a ancestral language in common that's called the proto-language. And um, because they're related, they, they share some things in common with each other. So if you and I had the same grandfather, we'd both be related. So A and B are related through a proto-language that no longer exists. They reconstructed it. They, try to figure out what it was like, okay? Now, so therefore languages have families. The most famous of the families globally is Indo-European, which is where the Western languages are Spanish and English, et cetera, and French and German, they came from, okay? The Philippine language also belonged to a family. And that family is called Austronesian, which stands for Southern Islands. Sorry, there you go. Okay, now this is the spread of Austronesian. The Austronesian languages are the most widespread area-wise uh, throughout the world, as you can see, but most of that area is water. But you can see that the Austronesian languages stretch all the way from Madagascar, if you remember that movie, which is off the coast of Africa, all the way to the right. And if it shows up there, you'll see Eastern Island, Easter Island, I'm sorry. So you can take a person from Easter Island and introduce him to a person from Madagascar and they can count to 10 and they'll kind of, you know, understand each other. That's how wide the spread of Austronesian is. Now, the other thing that's in this map is arrows. You see the red arrows and that marks how the linguists think the language spread through this area. So if you reverse the arrows and follow it back to the origin, that origin is Taiwan. So around 4,500 years ago, some people in Taiwan started migrating out of there and eventually their language through their um, descendants spread all over this area. Okay, this is an old slide, it's Japanese. And the reason I chose this slide is because the Japanese did not call that place Taiwan. They called it Formosa. That was the name of the island in Japanese times. And the linguists, in order to distinguish Taiwanese, which is a Chinese language, from the original aboriginal languages of that island, they called those aboriginal isle, uh, languages Formosan languages. Okay, so that's why I put that name up. So you'll see that Formosa is not that far away from Luzon. And the aboriginals that lived in the southern end of uh, Formosa were fishermen and they were very good navigators. And they eventually made their way down to Luzon, perhaps stopping in the Batanes, perhaps not. Uh, that's still not clear. But that is a very dangerous crossing. A lot of people have died trying to make that boat trip in their big bankas from uh, Taiwan to Luzon, but they eventually made it. If you're wondering, I guess, what the relationship is linguistically, I can only give you, I'll just give you one example, okay? In Taiwan, the, if you've seen a banana tree grow, the bananas line up in rows um, down the stalk and, it, and if you've just seen a banana in a store, you'll see it's kind of like a double row, sort of an intertwined double row. 
So it looks sort of like if you put your two hands together and you had your fingers there, that's what the banana would look like. So the word for um, that row of bananas originally was pulu, and that eventually became the Formosan word for hen. So then the language drifted down to the Philippines and then you had to think, well, okay, that's fine, it's 10, but then how do you say 20? And then they said, okay, well, the way you say 20 is you say two tens and three tens and four tens and five tens. So the, the, uh, the word in the Formosan language for uh, one is sa. So to say one ten, you would say sa pulu. But because the Philippine languages use what they call ligatures, like for example, in English you'd say beautiful woman, but in Tagalog you can't say maganda babae, it doesn't work. You have to put the ligature there and you have to say magandang babae. So instead of, you can't just say one ten, you can't say sa pulo, you have to throw in the ligature and you go sa nga pulo, sa nga pulo. And sa nga pulo, for those of you who speak Ilocano, is the Ilocano for ten. Now the Tagalogs decided that that's too long a word, so they shortened it to sampu. So if you speak Tagalog, that's, that's where your sampu comes from. And if you follow that thing straight down through the Visayas and into Indonesia, that pulu shows up there, all the way from Madagascar to uh, the Easter Island. Okay, so now, the, the similarities are not just in language between Formosa and the Cordillera languages. This, for example, is a display case, which you would figure you see in the Baguio market, you know, or the Easter weaving school or something like that. But that this is from Taiwan. This is a display in a, in a Taiwanese uh, indigenous store. And if you were in Benguet, you'd say, sure, that's a kayabang. That's a uh, backpack that instead of being strapped around your shoulders, is strapped to your head. And you'll see the head strap there at the bottom. But you'll also see in that little um, note there that it's all written in Chinese because this is, again, this is from Taiwan. And this beautiful view of rice terraces, this is from Taiwan, again. Now, just pause here for a second uh, to diverge a little bit and talk about uh, the tribal names. So uh, the most famous rice terraces are in Ifugao. And where does that name come from? Well. In the cosmology of the Ifugao, there are three worlds. There's the sky world uh, populated by gods. There's the earth world populated by uh, us, the humans. And there's the underworld populated by the Anitos. And that underworld is really a, a parallel universe to the earth world. Now in Ifugao, the earth world is called Pugao. And so in the classic Austronesian construction, if you are from Pugao, you are E Pugao. Okay, and so that's the, where the name came from and that's really the way to pronounce. Uh, I don't know how it ended up being Ifugao, but maybe the Bontox had something to do with it, I don't know. In Tagalog, the mountain range is called a Golot. And so if you are from the Golot, then you are E Golot. And that's where E Gorot came from. And Baloy is the other side of the river. So if you're from the other side of the river, I presume they mean the Agna River, then you are E Baloy. Okay. And in, in Bontok, because they like that F sound, you are E Funtok. That's, uh, that's the, how it goes in Bontok. All right, so now, having said that, the next slide I'm going to show is from Ifugao. This is a Kanyao and no self-respecting Kanyao is complete without the head. So there's your head in the middle, and you'll notice that the village is all out because this is a big celebration. And while the villagers are standing in the background, you look beyond them and you see the rice terraces. Now the fellow on the left side of the screen whose back is to you, he has just disemboweled a pig. And uh, the reason he disemboweled the pig was to take its gallbladder so he could then present it to the people squatting on the uh, right side of the screen. And those are the village elders. And they're going to look at the gallbladder for omens. I'm presuming, I don't know for a fact, this might be a harvest festival. But at any rate, that's the, the, the whole 
ceremony, the whole tradition, the whole ritual um, for purposes of, uh, I don't know, uh, <laughs> authentication or, or to make it work, you need a head. So the people of the Cordillera were headhunters. But actually, before the Spanish came, most of the people in the Philippines were headhunters. What the Spanish did was they were able to take control of the lowlands, and so they abolished headhunting in the lowlands. But they could not abolish it in the mountains because the, the, the mountain people were just too fierce for them. They could not control the mountains, with the exception of Benguet and the Abra. Okay, now, if you showed this picture to a person from Taiwan, he'd say, what, only one head? So I'll show you the next picture. And this is from 1930 in Taiwan. And by 1930, headhunting was done and almost completely eliminated by the Americans in the Cordillera. But it was still going on in Formosa. And the heads in the front of the picture belong to the people from one village and those heads were taken by the people in the back who belonged to another village because warfare in Taiwan as the same as warfare in the Cordillera was inter-village. There's no point in an Ifugao traveling days and days to get a head from Kalinga when he could just get a head from his neighboring village. Okay, so the concept of tribe did not exist. You're Identification was with your village, and that word is an Ilocano word is Ili, and so your fellow village mates were your Kailian. Okay. And that was that was your identification. There was no concept of belonging to a tribe. Okay, so the people from Formosa landed in the Philippines, they landed in northern Luzon, and they found the Cagayan River. Okay, and so they set up uh, their uh, um, their populations there. And then as their populations grew and they needed to expand, they followed the Cagayan River down. And then you'll see somewhere there past Gataran, you'll see a branch. So the main Cagayan River is called the Rio Grande de Cagayan or the big Cagayan River. But there is a smaller branch, which was called the Rio Chico de Cagayan, small Cagayan River. So it's now known as the Chico. So that group followed the Chico River into the mountains. Okay. The second group followed the Cagayan River all the way down to Ilagan. And then they, from there, they discovered the Magat River. And they followed that Magat all the way into the southern part of the Cordillera. So there are two groups of uh, migrants into the Cordillera, the people that followed the, Chica, the Chico River and those are called, uh, and those were called, uh, they went into Central Cordillera, so they were called the Central Cordillera group, and the people that followed the Magat, they ended up in the southern part of the Cordillera, so they were known as the Southern Cordilleran group. Okay, so what are the Cordilleran languages? Well, first, this is a geographically and politically defined term, okay? It covers languages that are spoken in the Cordillera Central or in the Cordillera Administrative Region, but linguistically, uh, there are two major groups that can be called Cordilleran, but they include a few languages that are not spoken in the Cordillera Central. So those two groups following the two rivers are the Southern that follow the Magat and the Central that follow the Cordilleran language. I'd like to uh, mention at this point that that expert in Philippine languages, I told you who lived many years in Bontoc, his name is Lawrence Reed, and this is one of his slides. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is the breakdown of the language groups. And so the Formosan people started off in Northern Luzon near the mouth of the Cagayan River. And then a group of them, what you'll see on the right side, spread out to uh, give rise to many different languages. Northeastern Luzon, that's the Sierra Madre. Cagayan Valley languages are Ibanag and Itawis and, and the like, and Ilocano. Then we go into the Cordillera and the those people are called uh, South Central Cordillera. And these, these are not languages. These are um, the estimates of what the languages sprang from, some old proto-language. 
Okay, and then they split into the southern and the central Cordillera. And so the question was, is migration, how did the south central Cordilleran languages get to where they are now? They began as a single language thousands of years ago. Remember, we talked about that, the origins of languages, but where it was spoken and what route did they take, which ultimately resulted in all the languages spoken today, that's the question. Many theories have been proposed, but most are only speculative. So we're going to take a look at what, uh, what Lawrence Reed thinks is how this migration happened. So the river valleys were the key migration routes because that's where people settle and they grow their crops and live. And then when they get very uh, populated, they move on. So the first settlers to move into Northern Luzon found the great Cagayan River Valley that was occupied by many groups of Negrito people. The Negritos came to the Philippines from the South. They migrated from what is now what they call Sundaland, which is somewhere in the Indonesia, Malaysia area, and migrated north. Then they, but they were there, they were not as uh, developed, I guess you could say. And so eventually they yielded to the people that came in from Taiwan. And so there are still Negritos in the Philippines now, but their language has been lost and they now all speak uh, Austronesian languages. Okay, so those that settled in the Cagayan River Valley, Valley gave rise to the Cagayan Valley languages and the others moved south. So it's the others that we're gonna talk about. Okay, so the first major tributary that they found was the Chico River. And this is where the South and the Central Cordilleran languages divided into what became two groups. So the parent of the Central Cordilleran group moved up the valley and into its tributaries, leaving behind the Kalinga Itneg group. So if you just look at the map, once you follow that Chico, Chico the first uh, group, the first province that you'll see in, in the Cordillera is Kalinga. Okay. The Itneg is uh, an interesting thing because uh, some people claim that the Apayao are really Itneg, but the Itneg eventually made their way all the way to Abra. So uh, maybe they left the group in Apayao or maybe they settled in Abra and then moved back over to Apayao, I don't know, okay? Others moved further up the Chico to where Bontoc and Kankanay are now spoken. Okay, so we're back to here again. So we're talking now about the group that split up and followed the Chico uh, deep into the Cordillera. Then he says, but there was one group who moved on, probably following the tributary, which meets the Chico River at Bontoc. I couldn't find a really good river map. But uh, I guess if you Google it, you, you'll find out where the tributaries of the Chico are. Okay, so that group left behind a group that developed into the Talubin language of Bontoc, then over Mount Polisadil and down the river valleys to become the Ayangan and Tuwali Ifugao languages. The Southern Cordilleran settlers moved on down the Cagayan until they reached the Magat. The first settlers left behind were the ancestors of the Ilongot and Bukalot people, a lot of them in Nueva Vizcaya. And then a group of settlers moved further up the Magat, leaving behind the ancestors of the Ibaloi and the Kalanguya groups. And this last one is where yeah, some people don't agree with Lawrence Reed. He said, some one group discovered the headwaters of the Agno and moved down into the lowlands, forming now the Pangasinan language. So um, if you go by Lawrence Reed, there is the Pangasinan, that lowland language is actually a Cordilleran language. Okay, so once again, just to show you where the, the people who followed the Magat River uh, ended up here, yeah, then you see the arrows heading straight for Baguio City. Okay, so the Southern and Central Cordilleran languages came from a common ancestor, probably spoken in Northern Cagayan province thousands of years ago. The major river valleys were the pathways of spread into the Cordillera. Some families settled and others moved on. So if you were settled early in the Chico, you were probably ended up being called the Kalinga. Dialect changes in one group eventually became separate languages. And these are today the Cordilleran languages. Okay, and now here are the Cordilleran languages. If you look on the right side, the central Cordilleran, you'll note that most of the Cordilleran languages we know today came from this central Cordilleran group. So Isinai, Ifugao, Ifontok, Malangao, Kankanae, uh, Kalinga, and Itnig. On the other side, the southern uh, Cordilleran, 
The one big group is the Ibaloy who settled in Southern Benguet. There are smaller groups, the Ikarao and the Kalanguya. But then there's Pangasinan. And then the other thing to note is how far away the relationship is between the Kankanae and the Ibaloy, even though they occupy the same province. And that shows you how divergent that migration was between the Southern and the Central Cordilleran languages. A, an Ibaloy will understand a person speaking Pangasinan much better than he'll understand a person speaking Kankanae, even though the Kankanae are their uh, fellow provincial province mates. It's not over though. If you notice on this slide, you'll see that there's not one Ifugao, Ifugao. There's many kinds of Ifugao. There's many kinds of Bontok, many kinds of Kalinga, many kinds of Etnik. So the languages continue to, continue to diverge even when they settled in the general geographic area because it's very mountainous. Okay, and some of these slides, well, I don't have it in the slides, but you'll see that some of these languages are more endangered than others. And that's the little colored, um, colored dots in front of each language. If you're blue or green, you're in pretty good shape. If you're brown or yellow or something like that, danger of uh, disappearing. And here's a funny thing from this slide, and I, I've questioned Laurie Reed about this. This slide puts what should be an Itneg language, they group it with the Kalinga. And that language is Banao, which is spoken in Balbalasan, which is one of the city, uh, areas in Kalinga. And uh, the language is really is different, but uh, it's in the province of Kalinga. So you wonder why that happens. And it happened because the provinces were set up not based on languages, but uh, just roughly based on geography and politics as uh, Laurie mentioned in his slide. And the person responsible for that is this guy, Dean Conant Wooster. Dean Conant Wooster had, for an American, he had pretty good experience in the Philippines. He was in the Philippines doing extended zoologic investigations during Spanish times. So when um, the Americans took the Philippines, uh, they, uh, Dean Wooster was the leading American expert on this country that they really knew very little about. So he, uh, he was part of the two Philippine commissions and he eventually became the secretary of the interior. Well, the second Philippine commission was headed by William Howard Taft, who was a very fat guy. He weighed about 350 pounds and Manila was hot and he was dying. But Wooster had been told, he'd never been there, but he'd been told by the Spanish while he was, while he was there during Spanish times that there was a cool area in the Northern Luzon mountains. So Taft dispatched him to find this cool area because the heat was killing them. Uh, so he went to Trinidad, which at that time was under American control, under the control of the American military. And from there in Trinidad, the, um, a German planter rode in and invited the group. There were several commissioners, two commissioners and their escorts there. And they invited, he invited the group to spend some time in his house, which was located four miles south of Trinidad in what was then a very tiny village or rancheria called Baguio. So here's the photograph commemorating that first visit of the Americans to Baguio. And you'll see Wooster over there, third from the right. And to his right is Luke Wright, who would succeed Taft as Governor General of the Philippines. And you probably know his name from Wright Park in Baguio. And then on the furthest left, seated down, that's the German that invited them to his house, which you see in the background. And that's my grandfather. So this house was located where Baguio City High School is now, if you know Baguio. Okay. And so because my grandfather spoke rarely at that time, he spoke English. Most of the white people in the Philippines then spoke Spanish. But he spoke English and he also spoke uh, Ibaloy and Ilocano and some other languages. So they made him part of the colonial administration. He was the provincial secretary of Benguet. Benguet was the first province to come under civilian rule. The country was under American uh, martial law at that time. And uh, he had 
some problems with the American military because they thought he was an insurrecto. So he had to leave the country and go to Japan and he had to earn a living. So he earned a living by teaching German, but he always had an interest in the Philippine languages. So he taught himself linguistics. And when he came back to the Philippines, he joined the University of the Philippines and he became their first professor of Philippine linguistics. Okay, next slide. And this is what Wooster did. Wooster did not want the Philippines to become independent. So what he did when the Philippine assembly was created in 1907, he tried to figure out a way to prevent the Philippine assembly from touching the Cordillera. And what he did was he took all those old provinces and he put them all together into a mountain province. So this was the original mountain province. It's huge. It's that entire shaded area over there. And he made sure that the mountain province would not be controlled by the Philippine assembly. He put that on himself. And so his idea was as long as the Filipinos cannot control this area, they cannot get the independence because they cannot claim that the Filipinos are together as a nation. If I can keep the Cordillera people separate from the rest of the Philippines. So that was his tool um, to try to prevent Philippine independence. And you can see the mountain province included a couple of things that we are no longer around. There's no longer an Amburayan province down there beside Benguet. And you notice that the Amburayan province stretched all the way to the coast because he didn't want the lowland governors who were at that time elected and were Filipinos to prevent commerce between his mountain province and the rest of the country. And similarly up north, he extended Apeyao all the way down to the Babuyan Channel uh, in Claveria. Okay, so because of this and because of his arbitrary drawing of those provincial boundaries, you end up with a lot of people who are say Kalinga, but they're not really Kalinga in terms of anything having in common, the most famous being the people of Balbalasan who speak a different language. So these provincial boundaries are Wooster created boundaries because the people at that time had no concept of tribe. Okay? There was no Ifugao tribe with a head Ifugao in that province. There were not, they were not uh, organized as tribes. Okay, and that's pretty much all I have to say, thank you. So just like I showed you in the beginning that thing of that strange language that you didn't understand, couldn't figure out, but it was English. So this may look strange to you, but this is Baguio. Uh, this wow. is a view of Baguio wow. taken from UP Baguio campus. Those buildings in the foreground are where Baguio City High is now. The uh, the, in between the two buildings, you'll see that flat area, that's the Cafaguay, that's Burnham Park now, and up in the hills in the distance, the City Hall and uh, Consabulary Hill and, and those places. Okay, so things change, languages change, places change. Uh, and sometimes they change for no really good reason, but that's a topic for another time. Okay, that's it, thank you. Uh, if anybody would like to get further information, just my email address is right there. You can just send me an email. Okay.